Hello, Michael here again with part two of the Pixar Surface Shader tutorial. Uh, if you haven't caught part one, make sure you go back and check that one out before you have a look at this one. Um, on this part, we're going to be having a look at iridescence, uh, fuzz, glass, glow and globals um, because they're fairly straightforward, so it should be pretty quick to get through. Uh, so why don't we get started? So iridescence um, is sort of like when you see uh, like a patch of oil on the on the on the on the street the the way it sort of like um reflects like rainbow colors back at you um or at the camera or whatever um this is what this is meant to sort of simulate so um i'll start an ipr and i'll just turn up the face gain and you'll see what it does so you get that um psychedelic sort of rainbow colors and how it works is it looks at these two colors that we've got here and it renders um, a range of colors between them. So if we look at the um, color wheel here, our primary color is set to red and our secondary color is set to that blue color. So if we look at where the red is on the, uh, on the, on the color wheel, um, everything counterclockwise between this red color and this blue color is going to be um, rendered. Um, and then if you want to reduce the amount um, rendered, if you move that slider closer to the red, you'll notice that that color changes to have much less. So the starting point can be wherever you want and the ending point can be wherever you want. Um, so if you wanted it to sort of end on the purple, um, but start on the yellow, then you can do that. Um, that's completely up to you. Uh, but we'll just stick with the defaults for now. Um, I'm gonna be using artistic like I was in the previous tutorial. Uh, these two other functions that we've got here, edge gain, uh, it works the same as um, it does with specular and the same as the um, Fresnel exponent. Thank you for uh, correcting me on the, the pronunciation of that, by the way, uh, to that viewer. Um, roughness, um, the same as specular, if you increase it, it will um, soften the specularity, as you can see. Um, and then let's have a look at advanced just finally. Um, so if I just reduce the roughness to 0.2 again, um, which is the default. Um, so fall off speed is um, the amount of distance it takes to transition from this red part of the color wheel to the blue part of the color wheel. So um, a sh smaller number will be a quicker transition. So if I change it to 0.1, you'll see that then transition is super quick. Um, you can barely see any of the other colors, if at all, between them. Um, whereas if you boosted it up to two, it's a much slower range, um, so you'll see, you might actually still miss out on some colors uh, depending on what the shape of the object you're looking at is. Um, so generally starting off at one is pretty uh, is a pretty good point too. I'm gonna switch to the close-up of the head now so I can explain the fall-off scale. So fall-off scale is the um, amount of time you will see the transition between the red and the blue repeat. So um, at a value of anything less than one, you'll only see half of the um, half of the range, as you can see there. At a value of one, you'll see the entire range, and then um, it will multiply at any value above one. So if we went to say 20, um, and if I reduce the roughness, so we can see that a little bit more clearly. So you can actually see um, the ranges of colors that that's actually moving through. Um, and from there, if you wished to, you could increase the roughness or do whatever you like. Um, at a scale of 20, it's not going to look very realistic. Obviously you're going to get, um, you'd only be using that for some artistic purposes or some sort of psychedelic thing. Uh, so generally you probably only have it set to one or thereabouts. Uh, flip hue direction is pretty straightforward. Basically what that means is instead of um, working counterclockwise from the red to the blue, we'll work clockwise from the red to the blue. So you'll only get the red, um, the indigo, purples, violets, and then the blue. Um, so I can show you that. So as you can see, there's next to no range in uh, that direction. Uh, we would have to move our red um, further away to get a better range of colors between um, now the green and the blue. Um, and finally, double-sided is um, probably only going to be used if you're using something like a, a two-dimensional plane, uh, something where you can you want to see the backside or back face of your mesh 
rendered, uh, which we can't see in this example, so I won't bother showing it. Um, so let's go back to our default and have a look at fuzz really quickly. I think the best way to do this is actually to give our uh, robot a bit of a color. So if he's got a um, green color like I've just added there. Um, so basically the way fuzz works is it sort of disperses light in um, to simulate sort of material, I guess would be the best example. Something sort of like a satin finish. Um, if I boost that up to 1.0, you'll see that the light starts to look a little bit more diffused around the shadows and the transitions a lot softer between the hard shadow and the light um, illuminated areas. But you can't quite see the fuzz very well. You can sort of see it on the top part here on the top of the speaker box. Um, but I can make that more obvious if I actually change this to be a color that comp complements our primary diffuse color. So if um, I take a low saturation color, um, you'll start to see that complementary color sort of make it appear more as though um, this is actually one material and it's not having an abstract light applied to it. So if you were trying to make a material surface, that's what I would recommend if you've got a, um, a primary color and it'd probably be better if I was using a slightly darker version. Um, if you've got a primary color that is uh, one flat color or if you're using a UV, you could plug the UV into this color node and then increase the exposure um, to to make it simulate the um, the color gain and finally cone angle is the way that the light is being reflected so at a lower value you will get a more pinpoint um, reflection um, and it probably won't be super obvious here so I'm going to go to the wide shot again and I can probably increase the gain a lot just to make it super obvious I think one might be too low a value Okay, now you can see it. So um, yeah, the smaller this number is, the sharper your edges are gonna appear um, where it's sort of getting that cresting light. Um, so at a standard value of eight, it's obviously now that we've got the gain all the way up, it's gonna be, because it's a wider um, angle of light being reflected, we're gonna see a lot more of it. So if I change the gain down to say uh, 15, um, and then if I increase that cone angle, it will increase the amount of light that's being reflected again. Um, glass is very straightforward. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change our color to be a little bit more white um, because it just seems to complement um, glass simulation a little bit better. Um, you could have your diffuse color or whatever you want, but um, just for the sake of this, I'm going to use white. So if you increase the refraction gain and the reflection gain, you'll see that you start to get a fairly realistic um, looking glass it's starting to transmit color through um, you can think of the refraction gain as how much light is being passed through the object and the reflection sort of just works like your um, reflection would on your specular model so if you lower it you'll just get less reflections which may make your glass look a little bit less like glass and more like uh, perspex or something like that um, the refraction color is the color of the light that's being refracted through your object so if I change this to uh, say a red now those parts where you're seeing the light being refracted through are now red um, so that I would recommend that you complement that color with your diffuse color so if I wanted to have a red reflection I would, refraction I would probably change my diffuse color to be red as well and it'll start to make a little bit more sense um, from a from a realism uh, standpoint um, with everything set back to white um, roughness would be the final one in this part of the lobe um, so roughness is very straightforward if you just increase it you'll get more of a frosted glass look um, so your reflections will be scattered a little bit wider um, and that's basically all there is to that uh, finally you've got um, refractive index under the advanced tab this is um, what uh, Basically, there's a table of, um, of refraction that has been calculated um, and that a lot of objects already have been given a value. So, for instance, I believe the refractive index of skin is 1.3. So if I was trying to uh, simulate skin for some reason with glass, I would change it to 1.3. Um, and basically how it works is um, it's 
it's measuring the amount of light being bent as it passes through the object. So a lower value will mean a, will mean a more acute angle in the bend. So if I move this down to 0.1 and I just get a higher angle so I can show you. Um, and I decrease the roughness so you can see the reflection a little bit more obviously. Okay, so what you can sort of see happening here, uh, particularly in the body, is the light that's been passed through from the bottom of the body um, is actually ref reflecting the top of the shoes. So the light's coming from the front, hitting that, and then bouncing out towards the camera. Um, so that's got quite a, a high um, bend in the light. If I increase that refractive index number to, say, 2, you'll get none of that, as you can see. Um, and one final option is um, thin. If you inc if you use thin instead of using the refractive index, just by keeping that at 1.5, you basically will get um, a glass that appears to be quite thin. Um, sort of like uh, instead of using a double glazed glass panel, it's like a very thin. I'm trying to think what sort of glass that would be like. Something that you would use for like a wine glass or something possibly. And if you want to make your glass appear to be more transparent, um, if you've got thin enabled, it's a good idea to sort of reduce the roughness as well so you can get that clean light being transmitted through uh, your object. Um, and the final lobe is interior. Um, I don't believe this actually works with the uh, Pixar um, path tracer, so I'm not going to have a look at that one for now. Um, all right, so let's go back to our defaults. Um, so glow is our f uh, second to last one. It is very simple. Um, you've got two things that you need to pay attention to. Uh, gain is just the amount that your object will appear to glow and color will be the color in which it is um, emitting. It's just that simple. Um, it's a good idea to complement your uh, diffuse color. So if I wanted it to look um, yellow, I would make a yellow diffuse color and then um, maybe sort of a desaturated yellow glow um, to give it a more realistic look. This would be used for things like um, maybe halogen lights or something like that, that that you wanted to make appear glow. Or I've actually used this shader previously to make a, um, a potion, uh, the contents of a, of a magic healing potion glow um, on one of my models. And um, finally are our globals. Um, so bump is very simple. It's just your bump map. That is a global bump map that so will bump everything. Um, shadow color is pretty straightforward. Um, if you change your shadow color to be red, you will get red shadows, um, which can be sort of handy if you're maybe trying to do something a bit artistic. Um, if you, once again, combine it with your diffuse color, uh, maybe make it a dark red or something like that, you'll get some interesting effects. Um, and presence is your final slider, um, and that's very simple. It just basically works as the transparency of that um, of that shader overall. Uh, this is useful when you're layering, um, as well as if you're just trying to make something look to be um, transparent. Um, you will actually have to restart your IPR to get it to um, sort of function sometimes so if you're making sort of some sort of ghostly robot this could be a useful um, thing but I will mention that this will increase your render times dramatically um, due to the amount of noise that this creates um, and yeah that's pretty much it for um, this second part of the tutorial next time we'll be looking at uh, subsurface scattering and single scattering um, which are quite nice in this new version uh, but are work a little bit different than you would be used to if you're used to the subsurface scattering material that came with render man 20. Uh, but yeah uh, that's pretty much it so thanks for watching look forward to that next tutorial click like if you liked this tutorial and found it useful or help other people find it as well and uh, click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future tutorials i've got at least one going up a week i'm putting a few extra ones out this week uh, to make sure that everyone can get up to speed quite quickly with uh, the new renderman 21 version but until then thank you very much for watching and i'll see you next time happy rendering